Okay, um, as James said, uh, and there are some colleagues here, um, namely uh, Teresa, Sheila and Kira from the Child and Family Research Centre here in the School of Political Science and Sociology. And I thought what I might do with you for about uh, 30 minutes is to um, present a kind of a social policy dilemma that we face uh, and just get your views on how to uh, work through the dilemma. Um, I titled this kind of, a subtitle, the original title is a, From a Concoction of Theory to Practice um, via a Social Policy Agenda. And the reason I did that is because um, what I want to try and do with you is to describe the work of the Child and Family Research Centre and the incoming UNESCO agenda, which actually don't necessarily fit from a policy <coughs> perspective. Um, but I do want to consider how research in children and youth can influence social policy both here in Ireland and internationally. And in order to bring the agenda on towards the end, I want to give you two very practical examples of things that we're working, two projects that we're working on at the moment, which typify this kind of dilemma, which I'll, I'll share and explain with you. Um, but most, just to explain about my practice background, I worked for many years in services in terms of, I worked for the HSC for many years, managing a whole range of services, and I was particularly involved in developing prevention childcare services like youth work programs, social work programs, family support programs, and so forth. Um, and uh, I suppose I was quite active in policy at uh, various stages. Um, you may or may not recall that in 1993, um, Justice Catherine McGuinness uh, issued what was called the Kilkenny Incest Report, uh, which, was in, which was the report of inquiry uh, into the uh, abuse of uh, a young girl who was then an adult uh, in, in Kilkenny. And it became a very famous report for a whole range of reasons, but probably because uh, at the time, Brendan Howland, who was Minister for, Just or Minister for Health at the time, announced three million of an investment in children's services in the light of uh, the abuse case. And it went on to, uh, in better times, to a lot of funding of children's services uh, in terms of kind of social policy for children. And of course, now with the Celtic Tiger getting pneumonia, uh, that is beginning to dry up and it raises amazing questions at the moment from the point of view of best spend uh, and best influence in social policy. So in my years of experience there have been four uh, ways that you got funded if you wanted to, in terms of, uh, uh, if you wanted to develop a children's service, if you're in the HSE or Bernardo's or the ISPCC or any organisation in Ireland that provided services. So one was from government policy in terms of planning that you could kind of predict. One, putting it very bluntly, was flavour of the month services. We'll come back to that in a second. <coughs> flavour of the month. One was bottom up what families say they need and children. So those children, families and workers say they need. So one is government policy, one is kind of flavour of the month that really was dictated by the minister at the time. One was bottom up and the other then was international proven breast practice models. Things that we know internationally that worked. So I'll give you one example of a proven best practice. One very good example is family welfare conferencing. That's where you have issues of neglect or abuse in a family among involving children. And rather than have professionals decide what you do, is you, do, uh, you, con you uh, conduct what's called a family group conference, where you get the set of supporters together for the child and family, and including extended family, neighbours, teachers, and so forth. And they come up with a solution or a plan, and you implement the plan. It's a very cost-effective, successful way of doing it. In terms of children, families and workers, that will be based on need assessment, what they think would work best, and how they assess their own need. Flavour of the month from ministers, and I've, been, I've not been anti-ministerial in saying this, is that certain things were seen that 
you know, this is the way we should do these things. And, uh, you know, from uh, civil service advice and so forth, I suppose. And the last one is government policy. And the main children's government policy that we've had in the last 10 years has been the National Children's Strategy of 1999, and more recently, the Agenda for Children's Services, which I want to come back to. So I'm going to call the first one A. This is uh, me doing an impersonation of Chris Tarrant in, um, what's that? Who wants to be a millionaire, isn't it? Yeah. So A, if you think it's that one. B, if you think it's that one. C, if you th think it's that one. D, if it's that one. So you have one vote and you have 30 seconds. Okay, which one do you think dictates policy most over the last 15 years? A, government policy. B, flavour of the month. Three, what children, families and workers say is needed. D, proven practice models. I didn't say answer. <laughs> okay, we'll have hands up for A. Anybody? B. C. D. Yeah. Well, the answer is B, to be honest. So it's quite a worrying trend. If you think about the fact that our job in the research centre is to try and develop, based on these two last ones, the reality of what we're finding. Now I think that may change, and I'm being slightly disingenuous, but not totally disingenuous about this issue. We'll come back to that in a moment, or in a while I should say. What I want to try and do, or what we want to try and do, is move from this. This is the Agenda for Children's Services, it's a policy handbook. It currently is the policy for children in Ireland. Uh, following the National Children's Strategy, and it was launched in December 2007. And myself and a colleague, Dr. John Canavan, and uh, Professor John Pinkerton from Queen's University in Belfast, worked with the Office of the Minister for Children to develop uh, this handbook, which we'll come back to later. But the reality of it is, any good policy handbook for children is really about getting from this to this. It's about the real lived lives of people. Uh, and uh, there are many, many examples that I could uh, share with you of how um, the services provided to people don't match what they receive. Uh, as uh, my colleague Dr. Brian Hughes and I both know, because we both have an interest in social support, for example, um, the need that most people in services, at any rate, have a need for tangible support, practical support, is by far the biggest need that they have. Um, but. Uh, Unfortunately, what do you think is the greatest type of support they receive from professionals? Do you think it's a practical things? It's advice. So if you need a washing machine, all the advice from a public health person, a social worker, won't wash your clothes. And it's a basic problem that we have in service provision for children. So I just want to briefly talk about the Child and Family Research Centre before talking about the UNESCO programme and then talk about where we're trying to get to. And there's an interesting uh, equation which emerges when we do this. The centre was uh, established in 2001 as the Child and Family Research and Policy Unit. And basically it came from the desire that myself and John Canavan and Professor Chris Curtin had at the time to develop a research centre that was interested in early intervention, prevention and family support in working with children. If you uh, where to take, for example, at the moment, the cost of keeping one uh, out-of-control teenager in Castle Blaney, uh, in the centre up there, it, it, uh, and compare it to one prevention programme cost for young people, the, uh, the euro sign is frightening. The centre were very honoured, and I was very honoured, that we received a UNESCO chair in October of last year. Um, and our chair is in the whole area of children, youth and civic engagement not just as one, type, one long title, but as separate uh, but connected titles. And the reason that we got very interested in civic engagement is that there is a body of research which is looking at the whole research on resilience, which is suggesting that if you can positively civic engage young people, children and young people in communities, in terms of both political civic engagement and social civic engagement, you can enable better outcomes in their lives. And this is something that we're very interested in trying to prove. So the, I know you had Eamon O'Shea in here, and one of the things that we're working with Eamon on is this idea of intergenerational uh, work between children and older people. I don't know if you talked about that, but that will be where you get elders in the community to provide wisdom 
to uh, younger people, to children and young people, and young people to provide uh, practical support around things like computers and Facebook and all those things which older people are interested in, but also providing protection. So we're involved in, uh, so we have a specific mission within UNESCO and we're a specific uh, child and family research centre. So basically we have this kind of double brief here at the moment. Our plan as a centre is in the, to uh, and I'll talk about freedom from existing work in a moment, is to bring these two entities together and that by 2011 we'll be the UNESCO Child and Family Research Centre. And that's to do with a whole range of issues about funding, which I want to come back to, and about uh, policy dictation. So that's our, our basic aim. In order for that to happen, there are a couple of things that we have to put in place. And these are typical issues for anybody running a research centre, but they're very, obviously very real issues for us. There is the issue of having staff with tenure if you want to run a research centre on children's the whole area of children. What I mean by that is that you're not going from hand to mouth. Now we've been very fortunate that we received substantial funding for which we're most grateful from the Atlantic Philanthropies, which is Chuck Feeney to those that know him well, uh, for which we're, we're very happy. Um, we're also working on uh, getting support for a building which is at a fairly advanced stage. Um, it's interesting that one of the centres that we compare ourselves to uh, that we aspire to is the Chapin Hall Centre for Children uh, at the University of Chicago. Um, and it's, one of the, it's the, probably the biggest children's research centre in the world. I think it is the biggest. Um, but it's interesting that one of the ways they went from hand to mouth was that they built up a reserve fund. Um, we obviously have, UNESCO in itself does not provide you with funding, but UNESCO is a goodwill prestige which is very, very, uh, very important to us and uh, uh, hugely important. So that's something that we're bringing into this cake that we're putting together. And we have all the products that we've produced since we were a centre. We've done a lot of research over the last eight years and we have the whole goodwill of staff and uh, expertise that we've brought, up, brought together. Obviously the, uh, the vision for the centre is a very important uh, kind of point that brings this together. And our vision is for family support and better life for children and families in need. That's the outcome that we want to achieve as a centre and as a UNESCO centre. So more specifically, um, there are sub-themes of which we're interested in. Family support itself is not a theory. It doesn't have any theoretical base. But we believe it involves four key issues that we're interested in. The theory of resilience, the theory of social support, the theory of social capital, and now the emerging theory around civic engagement, civic society. But we're not, we're very much an applied research centre because we're connected very much with services, as you would have gathered already, and we have a kind of passion for practice brokerage. And what I mean by practice, passion for practice brokerage is that we're very, a lot of people who work with uh, children and services, and including myself in my former life, did so without any theoretical basis or very little theoretical basis. Um, and we're interested in, in providing that to the, the practice community, which we do in part through our Masters in Family Support Studies program. But similarly, there are a lot of people in universities who have their heads in places where they shouldn't have them and don't live in the real world, and they don't understand applied practice. So what we're trying to do is bring two together. So we, 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 uh, I say that with great uh, respect to everybody, but that's the reality of it. So basically, we look on theory as know of, practice as know how, and this idea of reflective practice as an O2, as a key kind of uh, ingredient in the cake. And then we're hoping that we can play these things out. So any research we're doing, or should be doing, should be fitting into one of those themes. Resilient social support, social capital, and civic engagement. And then obviously we're interested in this from the international platform of UNESCO, which I'll come back to. But we're continue, we have a continued commitment to work in Ireland as well. It's not that the centre will not be working in Ireland. It just means that we will be working far more on an international platform. So we have a, a couple of uh, key points in terms of our work. Um, one is around, uh, obviously around research and teaching are kind of key uh, points. 
But obviously we're interested in policy and advocacy and the idea of progressing programs that work, interventions that work with children and young people. And we're going to look at some of those later. When we become a UNESCO Child and Family Research Centre, it will remain about uh, working on family support, but with concentration of children, youth and families and communities and civic engagements and computations of those uh, different parts. So it's not just singularly about children, youth and civic engagement, it's about the, the uh, different connections between these parts. So here's the first dilemma we have. This idea of getting to the Holy Grail. So the problem you have in any research centre is if you're living off soft money, you have to, he who pays the piper plays the tune. And you can end up, A, doing research work that you may not particularly want to do, but you're doing it because you need the money to pay the staff to stay afloat. Um, and the Holy Grail, or the heaven is over this side, is that you have enough money that you don't actually have to bid for research. And you can do just pure research on things that you want to do uh, uh, which is obviously where we get to. At the moment, I think we're about here, and for, or if things happen as I hope they, and think they will happen, we think by 2013 we'll be there. Um, I don't know if Kira or Teresa or Sheila want to make any comment about that. Do you think that's about right? <coughs> So on one hand you have the problem that you're doing tender work for which you tended for, for which you have to deliver on, um, but you also have the problem that some of the work that you've tended for and are delivering on may actually be contradictory to some of the policy. It may not fit with policy. So in terms of influence, it may weaken your capacity as a research centre to influence policy. Um, and like that's as simple as things like doing pieces of research for which, I mean, I've been really blunt about it very often, the number of days it takes to do a piece of work compared to what you pay for don't match, you end up actually losing money. You know, if you were a, a shop, you'd be, uh, the uh, till wouldn't be hitting as quick as it ought, ought to. So these are, you know, just practical issues. So even despite the fact that we have fairly major support from Atlantic Philanthropies, getting to that point is a key issue. And it's a key issue for us because we want to influence policy. So it's a key issue in, in the, the whole reason that we set up the centre to begin with. Um, within the kind of UNESCO program, there are four um, uh, key uh, uh, areas. The first one is in the area of research, the second in the, the, second in the area of teaching, the third in the area of policy and advocacy, um, the fourth is in the terms of programs, which I'll come back to later, and particularly in this idea of service development. By service development, I mean that we would, rather than be a team of researchers who just goes in and starts talking people providing services, we actually sit down with them and step by step develop models of intervention, um, very much in the kind of with, with, with the acknowledgement of the real world. Uh, in terms of teaching, we're about to develop an international master's in children, youth and civic engagement, and our current master's in family support studies is about to go international next year as well. And in addition, we've just uh, commenced a new PhD program with, uh, in collaboration with the Children's Research Centre in Trinity College on children and young people. So there's a whole range of um, things happening on all the fronts. On the research front, we're about to join the uh, Worldwide International Research Programme on Resilience, been led by Michael Unger in, in Canada. So there's a whole range of things that are beginning to kick into place. But I thought it might be useful just to, uh, for the purpose of this discussion, uh, to focus on some things that we're doing around policy that I think are interesting. Um, the first one, I mean, our overarching goal is to promote and advocate civic engagement in the context of international and na national international strategies and public policies focused on children and youth. So the first thing we're doing, in collaboration with the UNESCO Chair in the University of Ulster, Alan Smith, we're going to publish a biannual uh, all-island report on child well-being social support and resilience. 
One of the problems you have in, in certainly in the Republic of Ireland is that there are people producing State of the Nations reports on child poverty, on issues in schools, on issues in, in society, but uh, are not in a position to make actual any comment about them. Um, and uh, today I've just finished doing a submission to the Ryan, on the Ryan report, which is a horrific report, as you know. But uh, one of the things that we're talking about is uh, about a UNESCO involvement now in Ireland because of the, the whole concern that there is about children's issues. Um, we're also talking about having an international debate on children, youth and civic engagement uh, with UNESCO, which uh, will start actually in October of this year in, in the UNESCO office in Paris, where young people are being brought together to give their response to the global downturn. And there's a whole range of uh, activity around that. We've also been commissioned by UNESCO to develop uh, and disseminate uh, a range of policy papers on children, youth and civic engagement for UNESCO. And we're also doing work with UNICEF, the World Bank, the United Nations Universities and other UN bodies on that. But we also want to inform national policy. Um, and one good example of that is we've just been invited to engage with the uh, Good Friday Agreement uh, Child Welfare Policy Board, which has just been established. It's interesting that, uh, as Alan Smith pointed out, uh, certain people in the North call it the Belfast Agreement, certain people call it the Good Friday Agreement, depending on, I suppose, where you're coming from. But um, we're looking at an all-island child welfare uh, uh, project on policy for children, which is interesting and new. So they're kind of examples of the kind of policy work that we're uh, engaged in or about to engage in, uh, in this year and into the coming year. Just to say that there are four of the goals that are fundamental to the program. We're hoping to formalize uh, a sustainable international consortium um, involving NGOs, youth work professionals, um, and universities, and of course young people themselves. So one of the things we're planning uh, in 2010 and 2011 is to have a set of world, a forum which is a set of world events, uh, one in North America, one here in Ireland, one probably in the Republic of South Africa, um, and one in Asia, the venue not decided, where we bring together young people, uh, universities with an interest in young people, NGOs, and possibly state agencies as well, to discuss um, uh, their perceptions and how best to promote child welfare, including kind of family support stuff. Um, we're establishing a north-south uni twin network which in, you know, one of the biggest uh, risks that you have for UNESCO is that you have the North telling the South what to do. So obviously a fully uh, reciprocal, respectful network uh, is important and it's something that we're working on in terms of children and youth. Um, but there are, you know, we're also having the activities of the chair been evaluated independently. But the last point is a very important point, is about trying to get funding to deliver a strategic plan around UNESCO or for the centre. And you have this dilemma from a policy perspective that you may have people who would give you funding but it would inhibit your independence. Conversely, getting people to fund you independently to do the things you want to do is very difficult. So this is a kind of a policy um, dilemma. So the connecting parts then are around um, uh, research, uh, teaching, as I described, program design interventions, and policy. But the bottom line is really important because there's no point in us doing all that work if we can't give evidence that we're providing advocacy for children and families. And UNESCO have a program called the MOST program, which is a very, so it's about social transformations and worldwide it is the kind of core of the UNESCO agenda for children and youth. Just to let you know that UNESCO has um, uh, three priorities, HIV, AIDS, uh, gender and youth. They're the three priorities for UNESCO. Um, and in fact, the, the, their world conference is on uh, two weeks' time, UNESCO World Conference. But the point I'm making is that there's no, the, you know, the whole, uh, apart from kind of academic output and other things that you're expected to do as any research centres do in terms of PhD students and all those other things. Um, but in terms of policy for young people, unless our research agenda <coughs> informs our teaching, informs our policy, 
and, and what we learn from program design, there's actually no point in us doing this. It has to bring, the fruit has to bring it to the point where um, we, can, we can look at advocacy for children and families. So I thought what might be useful is to give you two examples of current projects we're working on. And from a policy, the policy parts, one is from the bottom up, um, and the other is from what I think is the top down. At the moment we're doing a, 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 a major study on Big Brothers Big Sisters. Now this has nothing to do with the Channel 4 programme, which is popular at the moment. Big Brothers Big Sisters is um, a, a youth mentoring programme which is going over 100 years in America. Um, and the idea is that you have an adult who befriends a young person a couple of hours a week. Did anybody ever hear of this program? Yeah. Uh, the, um, they're the most famous person not to get a big brother. To, sorry, the most famous person to get a big brother has been Bart Simpson. I don't know if you ever saw The Simpsons where the big brother ends up on a extremely stressed, to put it mildly, as you would have been a big brother to Bart. Um, the most famous person who never got a big brother uh, was Lee Harvey Oswald. But big brothers, big sisters in America never talk about that fact. <laughs> Um, but Big Brothers Big Sisters is one of the few very, it was a randomised controlled trial study by Tierney et al. in 95 in the States. It's, uh, there are over half a million kids matched on the programme, it's a big programme. But um, we're doing the randomised controlled trial study which is full of ethical dilemmas which I won't go into. But we're uh, uh, pretty advanced on the uh, research at the moment on the study. But it raised a whole range of questions about cultural <coughs> competence and reflective practice issue, issues for us. So, for example, on the programme, which is an American programme, uh, one of the things that bigs do in America is they hang out in the street corner with kids. Now, I don't know about you, but if you hang out in the street corner in Edenderry or Moat with kids, it wouldn't. If you don't do that, you know, it's just not what we do here. So there's a whole range of uh, kind of things with the programme that had to be put into cultural appropriate kind of uh, 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 methods for the manual. And also there were reflective practice issues about the program because the program is very much like a dosage program. You know, you do four hours a week, you go to see Galway United play, which is torturous half the time, but you know, you do X or you do Y, you do Z, you manualise it and you did it. It doesn't allow for, well actually I was at Galway United and the kid was very distressed and the kids started crying and became, you know, the pro so we had to make sure that from an Irish perspective, from the point of view of the study, that we uh, got that into, into place, which we did. But important, that importantly, which I think is the most important point of the programme, is it raises a really important policy question. If it's a very cheap programme to provide, costs very little, but if it is proven to be successful and if kids have better social support networks, are more resilient, do better in school, you know, a whole range of things, good outcomes for kids. But that actually can influence policy about the policy around admitting children to care. Because you could argue this is a good prevention programme for kids who are in vulnerable families and if they get an intervention early. So you can see how this programme, by a bottom up, could enable actually actual very good outcomes and very good policy for children. Can you see what I mean by that? If it's proven. That's not to say that that is a, it is a, a, I'm not doing a Hoover salesman on the programme, I think it has limitations. Uh, and it's not the only thing that works, it needs to be done in collaboration with other things. And in fact our research is showing that compared to the American research, because in America it's provided as a standalone <coughs> programme. They actually only do it if it's the only intervention kids get. Here it's been provided by Feroiga, and it's in addition to a youth work model, and we seem to be getting better effect size. A top-down one would be um, the centre, as I mentioned earlier, was commissioned by the Office of the Minister for Children to develop a policy for children which followed on from the National Children's Strategy. So we developed this thing called the Agenda for Children's Services, a policy handbook, um, which really is a step-by-step -step method to support families using reflective practice questions. Um, and the idea is that it contains a whole set of key messages around working with children and families. And the messages are actually addressed to people in the handbook. You can get it on the, online, it's, it's easy to get. But whether you're a policy maker, making decisions about the, you know, whether services go to Cork, Kerry or Donegal, or whether you're a frontline uh, public health nurse or a social worker on the field, 
the, 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 the idea is that you, talk, you look at it the same way and that it applies to you. That's the idea of the handbook. Um, we're working with the HSE nationally on the implementation of it and some people believe the implementation has been very slow. I think the, I think the desire from the Office of the Minister for Children is that too many policy documents come out that people don't read and they want people to use it, to value it before they use it. I think it's some, I think I can see both sides. But you can see the way from a child's perspective, from effective better outcomes for children, this is very much actually a top-down approach. I'm not saying one is any better than the other, but I'm just saying these are two different policy parts. Um, one thing that is interesting is that um, from the point of view of the uh, uh, centre, um, it raises a very interesting question when you look at the, 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 the parts of the work that we're doing, because uh, on one hand we want to get to that point I showed you earlier, where we can actually influence policy without feel, feeling in any way impinged as a centre. And I'm not saying that we're godlike and that we know everything about policy, it's not, you know, we're, we're deferential and all the rest of it. But it is an interesting dilemma that the longer a centre, any research centre on children, is, and it's an issue for any children's research centre, the longer that you're dependent on either commissioned work or pure evaluation work, your capacity to influence policy, I think, is in danger to some extent. Um, and you could argue equally that if you were to give them the, the holy grail immediately, because you hadn't cut your teeth over many years and dealing with some of this stuff, you might be able to actually give good policy advice. But it is an interesting kind of uh, dilemma. Finally, just to say that um, some, some uh, important events that are coming up. Um, uh, as a research centre, we're actually going to work and do some team building in Paris. One of the biggest problems with UNESCO is that it's not connected enough to its chairs and to people it works for. And its mission gets diluted by the time you get to Roscoff, never mind into Ireland. Um, so we're actually going over to team build with UNESCO in, in October. And really, we're putting together this kind of three-year plan for the end of October. Um, second to that, um, there is this World Policy Forum on Youth Perceptions and the Global Crisis, which will develop a set of messages for the UN and for governments. So it'll be interesting to see to what extent can the voice of young people, and it'll be very representative. It'll have young people from uh, uh, a range of countries and socioeconomic backgrounds and circumstances. So it'll be very interesting to see um, the uh, other thing that we're working on, as I mentioned, is an internet, intercontinental UNESCO forum on youth and civic leadership, which will be, we're at a proposal stage, um, uh, and that hopefully will start towards the end of next year. But it'll be very interesting because it'll be taking views from different continents and then bringing it to, the UN, to UNESCO and the UN in Paris to see if we can influence policy on children and youth. Um, and the last thing to mention is that we have a summit meeting in March of next year with our partners. Just to mention, our partners are Lithuania, Bulgaria as countries in transition, uh, Zambia, um, and probably now Vietnam and South Africa. And we're bringing them together. So, as you can see, I'm useless at PowerPoint because I put one thing over the text. But what that should say is, so we believe that as practice brokers we can design the run of the arrow. That is, that policy gets to the children and children influence policy. But it also means I'm useless at PowerPoint. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions on that or comments? A few minutes, I think. Yeah. No, I think you're right. I think there's a huge. I mean, there's a huge. We, what's interesting is that we're we're uh, one of the on the some of the qualitative end of the study we're doing with Big Brothers Big Sisters. Men particularly have a concern about child protection concerns on volunteering because of the fear of an allegation, which probably wouldn't have been there ten years ago. I think. And that you know, of course, people need to be please checked. And of course, kids. Have, the first thing is that kids are safe and so forth. But that's you know, I think there's, there. 
there, um, I think there are examples that in kind of within even within community settings, people are becoming a little less willing to come forward. I think is a bit of a concern. Um, and you're quite right. Uh, you know, kids live at home, school, and community. They're the, the places where things happen. And there is a risk that you can have over control of the state. Um, and I actually think, in the light of um, uh, the current climate that we're in, I think that could be a bit of an increased risk. One thing against that is that volunteerism seems to have gone down when the tiger economy went up. People have less time. And you may find that people have more time to volunteer again. So it'd be interesting to see in the coming years if that shifts back. Mike, yeah? uh, I just uh, want to challenge your, your um, view on the, the, the funding and your capacity to do sort of objective research. Or, you know, yeah. I think it's having a mix of sources. Um, I think you know, you, you're going to have to establish your work in terms of publications, in terms of your competitiveness to win um, projects, uh, be able to go into the European Union to get uh, uh, framework projects and so on. I, mean, I, I certainly wouldn't want to, well, I think it would be dangerous to rely on some uh, philanthropic funding mm -hmm. and just leave it at that. Uh, yeah. Because that's, I think you have to build up the capacity to be able to go out to different sources mm -hmm. uh, because we know you know, the philanthropic stuff might just disappear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, Right. Yeah, it's a fair point. I mean, I, I, I mean, I did. I mean, we're, we're just. I suppose say that we're being independently reviewed, and you know, we've targets around publications, and we actually. I mean, in, in fairness, our philanthropic funding only makes up about. I think it's about, overall, it's about thirty-five percent. We've gained a lot of contracts, but I suppose my concern is that. Um, I suppose, being honest about it, in the in the current climate, the amount of funding available for children's research as compared to children's services is going to diminish. I think just bits, a little bit of an added pressure at the moment. Um, uh, yeah, but I accept the point. Yeah, you, I mean, you need to put yourself, you need to position yourself and, and to have conditions whereby you lessen these risks as much as possible. You're absolutely right. But I suppose the difficulty is that, um, uh, putting it bluntly, just a, you know, when the uh, Child Care Act was passed in July 1991, they had to ring bells in Dol to get enough TDs out to vote it in. Um, you know, and it just children's issues are a funny. They're a funny market, I suppose, is what I'm saying, I think, a little bit. You know, but anyway. In terms of your, your agenda document there, it's very interesting that you, in terms of that document, you, you address policymaking and a frontline practitioner, sort of, your messages for both. Was that very deliberate, or was it in terms of orchestrated from the, the office of the Minister for Children, or was it in terms of your initiative, in terms of being, for policy documents to have value? Yeah. Uh, you need to, you know, for, you know, need to give some practical, support to the stakeholders that potentially would read yeah. it or use it or... I think, it, in fairness, it actually came from the, the, the Director General, Silda Langford, in the Office of the Minister for Children, because she was very, very aware of the fact that um, most people, when they hear the word policy document, particularly if they're very busy practitioners, they'll use it, they won't read it. Um, so the idea was to try and to develop something that was shorter and a bit more interactive and flexible. And it took a huge amount of work to actually get it down. It's a very tight document. It's much easier to write reams of stuff, but actually get it down was quite difficult. Um, but I suppose the issue at the moment, of course, is that, um, you know, being blunt about it, in the, with the current natural and rightful concern there is about protecting children, that the whole idea that early intervention, early in the problem uh, policy might get pushed aside. I think there is, you need a continuum, of course, but, but there is a risk. And the idea, the, the, the agenda was that everybody had a common agenda, whether you were a policy maker, principal social worker, the head of Bernardo's, the head of the ICC, you know, a HSE child care manager, or frontline staff, you had the same agenda. Yeah. Okay. okay.